Good afternoon. I apologize again for being late. I'm delighted to open this Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriations Subcommittee hearing with FBI Director Christopher Wray. Um, we're very pleased to have you here and look forward to our conversation. I, I will just point out before we go into the hearing that um, we're going to take members and anybody who arrives after the gavel in order of arrival and that everyone is appearing in person. We're not having anybody appear remotely. So thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon and we will begin. Director Ray, the FBI continues to be the gold standard for law enforcement agencies worldwide. We count on the more than 35,000 men and women of the FBI to protect our country from violent criminals, terrorists, and foreign agents who mean us great harm. I want to thank them, and of course you as their leader, for their dedication and service to the nation, and in particular for their response to the attack on the Capitol on January 6th and their ongoing investigations into this insurrection attempt. The work of the FBI, as we'll hear today, is vast, but it's critical. It covers key investigations into counterterrorism, intelligence, child exploit exploitation, and financial and health care fraud, as well as the operation of the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, the system that checks available records to ensure people purchasing firearms can legally own them. This year's budget is a request of $10.3 billion, and it reflects the need to support the important missions of the FBI. For the FBI's salaries and expenses, this request is an increase of $465 million above fiscal year 2021 enacted. And I would just, it struck me as I was going through um, the briefing on the budget that your request calls for hiring over 150 new personnel. And I'm going to be interested in hearing if you have any concerns about actually finding people given some of the other challenges that I know um, we're having with workforce um, in other parts of the country. But of course, the FBI faces newer challenges almost daily. We all saw one of those challenges, ransomware, front and center in the news last month as the Colonial Pipeline shut down. That was followed by an attack on the systems of meat processor JBS. Now, thankfully, both companies were able to get their systems back online, and the FBI even helped to track down and return nearly half of the ransom Colonial Pipeline paid. Um, so congratulations to you and all the agents who were involved in that effort. Of course, unfortunately, not everyone has success with unlocking their IT systems. And it's not just large companies that are being targeted by hackers. It's also smaller hospital and education systems, small businesses, and even police departments, as we saw recently with the Metro DC Police Department. The New Hampshire Insurance Department has just issued a warning to insurers on June 11th of possible ransomware attacks with a few best practices to protect IT infrastructure and data. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this problem, how the FBI can help, and how we can try to get better reporting on these kinds of crimes. I've also been deeply concerned, as I know the other members of this committee are, by the reported directed energy attacks in Cuba, China, and other locations on our government personnel. These attacks have left American public servants and their families suffering alone for years with mysterious brain injuries without full transparency or guarantee of treatment. Fortunately, we're seeing improvement in that area, and I was pleased that the Senate passed the Havana Act on June 7th. I hope the House also quickly acts to pass it. This bill would allow the CIA director, the Secretary of State, and leadership at other federal agencies provide injured employees with additional financial support for brain injuries. I will have some questions for you today on the FBI's ongoing investigation into these attacks and how you're working with other agencies within the government. So I look forward to your testimony today, Director Ray, as I know we all do, and to our discussion. With that, I'd like to now turn to Subcommittee Ranking Member Senator Moran for his remarks. Senator Sheen, thank you for convening uh, this hearing. And Senator Sheen convened uh, a classified hearing with the director in March of this year. However, Director, this is the first uh, hearing with you uh, in the CJS subcommittee since May of 2019, so welcome back. Uh, before turning to the, FBI budget, the FBI's budget request for this fiscal year, uh, I want to express my condolences 
uh, at the loss of Agents Laura Schwarzenberger and da Daniel Alfen in February of this year. Shortly after their deaths, just a few days, I met with special agents and staff at the FBI Miami's field office, and it was apparent to me that both of those individuals were highly regarded. They were considered friends and family. And so I express my deepest sympathies to the entire FBI Bureau family. Um, Laura and Daniel are heroes, uh, and our country should always remember them as such. In regard to the budget that's before us, Director, the FBI is requesting $10.2 billion for salaries and expenses in fiscal year 2022. This amount is $465 million, or about 4.8% above the fiscal year 21 that was enacted. However, more than two-thirds of that amount is for inflationary costs. Uh, perhaps I'm making a statement that you'd want known. It includes employee benefits and rental space. The FBI is only requesting $151 million in programming increases. These are for initiatives that will actually bolster the FBI's capacity to execute its mission. And while employees and staff and space are important, there are a lot of initiatives that I think the FBI needs to be fully engaged in. Uh, in the news, we, the FBI's efforts to protect the United States from terrorist attacks, uh, from, for counterintelligence threats from governments like China, uh, to neutralize threats from cyber criminals, ransomware gangs, uh, they're, they're apparent. However, the FBI budget also supports critical law enforcement and public safety matters, including $492 million to combat international drug cartels and violent gangs, $62 million to investigate and prevent human trafficking, and $223 million to address crimes against children. Kansans, like most Americans, are deeply committed to public safety and strongly support law enforcement. This hearing is an opportunity for you, Director, for the Bureau to explain how it is putting tax taxpayer dollars to, its, uh, to good use to benefit the safety and, of our public. Uh, and I look forward to working with you and Senator Shaheen, members of this uh, committee, this subcommittee, as we work to craft uh, the fiscal year 2022 appropriation bill for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Senator Moran. Director Ray. Well, good, good afternoon, Chairwoman Shaheen, Ranking Member Moran, uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I want to first thank you all for the support that you've provided to the FBI in the past uh, and for inviting me here today to talk about the Bureau's fiscal year 2022 budget request. In many ways, uh, the men and women of the Bureau are busier today than we've ever been. In fact, I will tell you that hardly a day goes by when I'm not struck by some inspiring demonstration of courage and sacrifice on the part of our workforce for the American people. You know, the depth and the breadth of their impact on a remarkable volume of threats is just extraordinary. I mean, just within the past couple of years, we've thwarted potential terrorist attacks in places like Las Vegas, Tampa, New York, Cleveland, Kansas City, Miami, and elsewhere. In a single month recently, we arrested over 600 violent gang members. That's one month. Every 10 to 12 hours, we're opening a new China counterintelligence investigation. Uh, you all both mentioned ransomware. We're now investigating over 100 different types of ransomware, and each of those types has scores and scores of victims. We've opened hundreds and hundreds of COVID fraud investigations. We performed a record high last year, 40 million NICS firearms background checks. Every single day, every single day, we receive thousands of tips to our National Threat Operations Center, our NTOC, many of which involved imminent threats to life that require swift action by our field offices and our partners. And many of those threats involve harm to children. And just over the last year or so, our folks arrested over 1,400 of the worst child predators, saving hundreds of kids from sexual exploitation. And the list goes on and on. Now keep in mind, this work happened right in the teeth of the global pandemic because of course the FBI kept coming to work every single day. And it's also happening despite the troubling upsurge in attacks against law enforcement officers throughout the country. 
So far this year, the number of officers murdered on the job is far surpassing last year's pace, and it's about two officers murdered per week. Tragically, that includes the loss of two members of the FBI family, as Senator Moran mentioned. Special Agents Laura Schwarzenberg and Dan Alfin both shot and killed down near Miami in February. And we honor Dan and Laura's memory every day through our work, work which has unfortunately not gotten any easier given the diverse array of threats we face as a country. Uh, that's why I appreciated having a candid conversation with all of you uh, during the classified roundtable back in March. And I wish that I could tell you that we've got all the resources we need to carry out our mission to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. But the funds that we are requesting will go a long way towards doing just that. And before we turn to your questions, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the enhancements that we're requesting. So first, terrorism. Terrorism remains the FBI's top priority, as you know. With our partners, the FBI has already made over 500 arrests in connection with the Capitol attack to date, which is an extraordinary undertaking, and there is more work and more charges sure to come. Unfortunately, January 6th was not an isolated event. Domestic terrorism has been and continues to be a top concern for the FBI, so much so so much so that over the past three years, we doubled our domestic terrorism investigations and arrests. And that's in no small part because of the rise in racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists, which I elevated to our highest threat priority level back in 2019, and because of the rise in violence from a whole range of anti-government, anti-authority actors over the past year, including last summer, and in different ways, of course, on January 6th itself. Now, I've repeatedly highlighted the severity of the threat more than a dozen times in testimony since starting in this job, and it's why we're requesting a $45 million enhancement for additional personnel and tools to investigate the domestic terrorism threat and more easily share information with our partners. Second, cyber. Cyber is another of our top priorities, and it's easy to see why with intrusions like the Colonial Pipeline and SolarWinds hacks and the Hafnium compromise of Microsoft Exchange servers becoming all too common. While dealing with those, we're also contending with hundreds of other cyber threats from nation state and criminal actors alike. And our $40 million enhancement request is an important step towards ensuring that we've got the right people and tools in place to address the evolving threats by some very sophisticated cyber adversaries. We're also asking for an enhancement of a little over $15 million to improve our own cybersecurity. Those funds will help us secure our infrastructure and limit vulnerabilities that threaten the FBI's mission. And we're requesting funding to address our dramatically expanded jurisdiction over crimes committed on tribal land following the Supreme Court's McGirt decision. That $25.5 million enhancement will fund our increased operational needs in the state of Oklahoma while federal, state, and tribal authorities work on a more long-term solution. Of course, these things that I just listed off are far from our only challenges. On top of all these things, we also face an unrelenting counterintelligence threat from China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea and the full spectrum of criminal threats from hate crimes and other civil rights abuses to violent crime spikes in a whole bunch of cities across this country to human trafficking and crimes against children, just to name a few. The funding you provide will help us address all these areas. So thank you again for making sure the FBI has the resources we need to stay ahead of our adversaries and keep the American people safe. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much. You pointed out that both Senator Moran and I raised the ransomware attacks in our opening remarks. It wasn't clear to me, looking at your budget request, exactly where that was covered and whether you feel like you have the resources that you need in order to address this um, kind of activity. Can you just be specific about 
where you're looking to get the resources and what you're going to need? Right. So the uh, the our uh, our budget request, the enhancements we requested uh, include uh, 155 positions and 40 million dollars for cyber, and a huge part of that will be going very much to the ransomware campaign that we're working on. Uh, we uh, did about 1,100 different kinds of disruption actions against cyber adversaries last year. I'm talking about arrests, criminal charges, convictions, dismantlements, disruptions. And I think on the ransomware piece specifically, our strategy is to go after the entire criminal ecosystem that exists there. So not just the people demanding the ransomware, but uh, all the people who help facilitate it. You know, the, we're trying to go after the actors. We're trying to go after the helpers. We're trying to have to go after their infrastructure. Uh, we're trying to go after the money. You mentioned uh, our efforts to recover uh, the cryptocurrency that was paid in ransom. Uh, so things like that. But it has to be a cross-the-government effort. Uh, our National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force uh, brings together about 30 different agencies, uh, all co-located together uh, with an effort to try to have more joint sequenced operations to, to maximize impact. Uh, we've got to take a little bit of our page out of the counterterrorism strategy book. Everybody working together, focusing on prevention and disruption, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, two related questions. There are some people who suggest that we should outlaw payment for ransomware attacks. Do you agree with that? And second, how, how do we go after groups like in the Colonial Pipeline case where we think they're operating out of Russia with full um, knowledge of the Putin administration in Russia? So uh, our guidance to industry uh, is not to pay the ransom. Uh, and there's a whole host of reasons for that. But the most important thing, the most important thing, because I understand it's a difficult decision for victims to make, uh, the most important thing is that they reach out and connect with, with law enforcement, with us, as quickly and transparently as possible. It's, it's a little bit like the example, uh, you know, we, we encourage people when there's kidnappings of humans hmm. not to pay the ransom, but you want to have, in effect, the cyber equivalent of the FBI agent sitting there with the person talking to the hostage taker because there's all kinds of things we can do to help ensure a happy ending to the investigation if we're engaged early and transparently. So that's the most important thing. But in general, we would discourage paying the ransom because it, uh, it encourages more <laughs> of these attacks. And frankly, there's no guarantee whatsoever that you're going to get your uh, data back, mm. among other things. So do we need to think about changes legislative changes to address authorities for law enforcement and the FBI on um, hacking incidents and ransomware incidents. Um, I remember several years ago we had proposed legislation that never went anywhere that would have required reporting by companies. Should we be looking at something like that again? Well, uh, I obviously don't want to get out in front in, in terms of a specific legislative proposal, but I will say that um, if we don't solve the riddle of how to get the private sector promptly and transparently working with us. And more and more companies, I should say, are doing that all the time. But if we don't make that sort of the norm, we're going to have a heck of a time winning this, uh, this conflict, if you will. Um, and so anything that helps provide more incentive for that to happen, I think, is uh, a step in the right direction. Good. Um, I mentioned in my opening comments, and we've discussed this before, the what has been called the Havana Syndrome. How how involved is the FBI in the cooperative effort in the administration to take a look at what's happening with um, these attacks? Do you think can these be classified as a crime? And if so, how how do we go after either the perpetrators or allow victims to get restitution for what they've suffered? So uh, we are very much involved. We're working closely under the auspices of the NSC with our interagency partners, especially the CIA, DOD, the State Department, and others. 
um, and uh, bringing what we can bring to the table. Uh, our highest priority, of course, uh, is the protection and well-being, the health and well-being of U.S. government personnel. We are making progress uh, for sure, but we're not yet at a point where um, where we know the cause of, uh, of the incidents uh, and, and whether it was an attack, and if so, who did it, et cetera. Um, I will tell you that we're trying to be aggressive, uh, and we are viewing uh, all of the U.S. government personnel who have these symptoms, from our perspective, they're victims, uh, and we want to treat them as potential victims. And um, there are colleagues in the federal government, so we care deeply about them. Thank you. Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you. Um, Director, I recently visited McAllen, Texas, uh, where I met with your special agent in charge of the San Antonio field office. He was able to brief me on the counterintelligence threats to the area, specifically to mainstream, mainstream companies with a national security or innovation focus, such as SpaceX. Uh, what I heard was disturbing, uh, terribly threatening, in my view, to the well-being of Americans and to our economy. Director Ray, are you aware of those threats, and what can you tell us in this unclassified setting about the, this topic? Well, I'm, I'm very pleased that you were able to meet with uh, SAC Combs. Um, it's a very high-performing office down there, and they're dealing with some very challenging and complex threats. Um, and, of course, I've spoken in the past about uh, the very serious counterintelligence threats that I think we face from our adversaries. And we've been very focused on working with the private sector, specifically on the counterintelligence front. And as the U.S. moves more and more towards the private sector uh, in terms of space exploration, we need to support those companies in much the same way, for example, we would support NASA. Uh, and I think beyond that, it'd probably be better for me to arrange, uh, you know, some kind of classified briefing for you, because I, I can't get into a whole lot more detail in an open session. Uh, perhaps if it's okay with you, I'll look for a time for me to come to, to see you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, over the last two weeks, Axios uh, has extensively reported on massive fraud within the unemployment insurance programs. The numbers are staggering. Experts suggest that criminals may have stolen as much as half of the unemployment benefits distributed over the last year. Fraudulent claims could reach $400 billion. Alarmingly, the bulk of these funds appear to have been stolen by foreign criminal syndicates, making this, Axios observes, not just theft, but a matter of national security. Director Ray, what is the FBI's best assessment of the extent of unemployment insurance fraud over the last year, and how much is believed to have been stolen by foreign criminal organizations? So uh, we obviously share your concern. We've seen a, a, a huge spike, huge spike in unemployment fraud uh, cases and investigations uh, from COVID. Uh, by last count, uh, and this is a rough number, but by last count, I think we had about 800 unemployment fraud investigations, um, and the vast majority of those have some tie to the, to the pandemic. As far as uh, foreign criminal involvement, uh, we certainly are aware of a number of schemes and scams, uh, but I don't know that I have any kind of estimate uh, of how much of the, the overall loss comes from those kinds of actors, but it's something that we're, we're keenly attuned to. Uh, and of course, we're trying to take advantage of both all 56 of our field offices here, but also working with our, uh, our LEGAD offices overseas because they may be able to work with foreign partners to help us pursue you know, bad actors elsewhere and their involvement. Director, thank you. Uh, I hope to have maybe additional conversation in this regard as well. In September, the FBI uh, will release its annual data set on violent crimes in, in the United States. That report will show what you have already acknowledged publicly, a spike in serious violent crime in a number of American cities, including, including significant increases in murder and aggravated assaults. Kansas, unfortunately, has not been immune. The city of Wichita reported 59 homicides in 2020, the highest total since 1993, and about one every six days. According to Wichita Police Chief Gordon Ramsey, this trend has continued into 2021. In your speech to the International Association of Chiefs of Police last year, you acknowledged the FBI can play a critical role in, inducing, in, in reducing that violent crime. 
including by surging agents and other FBI resources to affected cities by working together with state and local partners. Director Ray, what is the FBI doing to address these serious spikes in violent crime? And would you consider further surges of personnel and resources to those affected communities? So uh, we absolutely are concerned about the rise in violent crime, specifically the most dangerous type of violent crime, namely the homicide rates uh, all over the country. Um, and key to that is partnership. Uh, we are bringing our resources to bear through our 170 or so Safe Streets Task Forces, our 50 or so Violent Crime Task Forces. So you're talking about 500, give or take, you know, FBI agents plus task force officers. Um, you know, I think we did 6,500 violent crime arrests uh, amidst the worst of the pandemic. So you're talking about 14 a day. Uh, you know, we are also trying to contribute in other ways uh, through NICS, making sure that guns don't get in the hands of the people legally prohibited from having them, uh, our tip line, our lab supporting state and locals, uh, and we have, to your point about surging resources, we have recently created a new violent crime rapid deployment team uh, the perp at headquarters, the purpose of which, run out of headquarters, I should say, the purpose of which is to be able to surge to uh, sort of crisis situations. I know that in Kansas City, in that, I don't mean Kansas City, the city, but the division, uh, we had 140 uh, gang uh, arrests and 200 something violent crime arrests uh, last year uh, and I remember I think we spoke once about the uh, in Wichita there was a, a gang the uh, the junior boy violent gang that you know that one takedown largely dismantled a long-running gang a gang in uh, in Wichita that you know was 20 say 25 arrests seizing guns drugs money uh, and so forth so we're going to be trying to do more and more of that wherever we can Director, I thank you and the, and the uh, Kansas City FBI Bureau for their attention to Kansas communities, Kansas City and Wichita in particular. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, I would just say, say to, to the director, I also am the ranking member of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs. It's meeting at the same time. My absence from time to time today uh, will not be a reflection on my in lack of interest in what you have to say. Thank you, Senator Moran. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, uh, Madam uh, Chairman. Um, I watched the um, CNN show Sunday night on January 6th, and it's been nearly six months since the Capitol was attacked, and I think we still lack a clear picture of the FBI's understanding of the threat in the days leading up to the attack. The Post reported in January that dozens of individuals listed in the terrorist screening database traveled to Washington before the Capitol attack. The FBI's Washington field office, I understand, stated that the Bureau disrupted the travel of a number of individuals who were planning to travel to D.C., quote, with intentions uh, to cause violence. It's my understanding that you testified last week to the House Oversight Committee that, quote, none of those people had indicated an intention to attack the Capitol. Um, as you look at this now in perspective, uh, Director Ray, could you clarify for us what the FBI knew and what it didn't know before the attack took place? Well, I guess the, the first thing I would say about the facts leading up to January 6th is because of all the investigations we're doing right now, we're continuing to learn all sorts of things uh, post-January 6th. And sometimes there gets to be a little bit of conflation about information that we're developing through those hundreds of cases with information that we had before. So I just want to put that out there in front because I'm sure there will be continue to be uh, news coverage of different sorts uh, as we move forward. I think uh, what I would say is that before January 6th, we were, uh, to my knowledge, aware that there would be large numbers of individuals coming to D.C. to participate in protests, protests, uh, and that we had some information that gave us concerns about the potential for violence more generally. Uh, there's, of course, this Norfolk report, 
which has gotten a lot of attention, uh, which is a, was a one piece of information that was raw and unverified uh, and unattributed, and we passed that three different ways as quickly as possible shortly after getting it. What we did not have, to my knowledge at least, uh, is intelligence indicating that hundreds and hundreds of people were going to breach the Capitol complex. That, to my knowledge, we did not have. Now, you mentioned these individuals that we interviewed or, or disrupted uh, before January 6th. Uh, I think there's a little bit of garble in maybe some of the news reporting. Uh, so I can't, I can't speak to the specific article that you were citing, but just in general, what we're talking about there are a, a handful, a small number of individuals who were uh, previously predicated subjects of investigations who were approached in one way or another um, uh, interviewed or in some other way disrupted from traveling. I want to be clear, though, there's a big difference between people indicating that they might travel to D.C. and people indicating they might travel to D.C. to commit a violent attack, much less a violent attack against the Capitol, uh, which is not my understanding of what those individuals uh, revealed uh, beforehand. I think many of us are trying to understand and not to criticize as much as to be able to correct our systems, um, the number of people. And if you watch the CNN show Sunday night, which went on and was very graphic, um, there was no question when you really had uh, pictures of who was there and what they were doing that people came with an intent to do what they did. And I have never really been able to get a clear picture of what is what was known and what wasn't known because what I saw on television Sunday night was something I've never seen before in this country like that. And it was shocking. Well, we consider the whole event shocking and appalling, and we are absolutely determined to make sure that we do our part to make sure it never happens again. So I want to be crystal clear on that. I think, um, you know, something, one thing that gets a little bit lost sometimes is that even though we've had hundreds and hundreds of domestic terrorism investigations ongoing, actually very, very few, almost none of the people who we've arrested since um, January 6th, for January 6th, were people. How many were, people did you arrest, have been arrested? I think we've got around, well, I think it's a little over 500 arrests now, uh, once you include, uh, there are a few that have been done by some of our partners as well. It's so the FBI's arrests are close to 500, and then when you add in the, the partners, it's a little over 500. And I want to be clear, we've got hundreds more investigations still ongoing, uh, and we expect in many cases we'll have even more serious charges against some of the people we already have charged. So this, this is far from over, and with each... Uh, arrests in each case we bring, not only are we driving towards accountability for the attack, but we're also learning more uh, about what was out there beforehand so that we can use yeah. that to get better going forward. Well, it was pretty clear from the footage I saw Sunday night that a lot was out there that came with intent. Now, proving it is another story, but um, th this was an eye-opener for me as I watch that show. And I think it's really important that we understand not to criticize it's over, but to know what to do to prevent that from ever happening again. Well, I, I, I agree that absolutely we want to do our part, and I haven't seen the particular CNN uh, show that you're talking about, but certainly we're looking at things like how can we develop better sources how can we get better with data analytics for the volumes of information that we get? Uh, how can we deal with the encryption issue, which I know is something you and I have spoken about in the past, and that is very much a phenomenon with this threat because uh, a lot of the most significant and revealing communications between these actors, and we saw it related to the January 6th people now that we're investigating, and we saw it over the summer uh, with some of the attackers uh, in those events, uh, it's through encrypted messaging communications, uh, and we've you. got to figure out a solution to that. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Senator Graham. Uh, thank you, Director Ray, and please pass on uh, all of our respect for what you and your agents and support personnel do. Uh, it seems to me you got a pretty full plate. Is that fair to say? Uh, it, it certainly feels full. Okay. Uh, if Senator Moran's right, which I'm sure he is, uh, when you look at personnel cost increases and generally cost of doing business, most of the increases requested, about 65%, go to that, and $150 million left for new programs. Do you agree with that, new capabilities? Well, I think uh, sometimes I have a little bit of a hard time in this format tracking all the numbers. I think one of the, one of the challenges is that uh, last year's budget had a significant number of enhancements, but at the same time also uh, a bunch of reductions to the base. So it's like a giveth one hand, taketh yeah. away with the other. If, if the committee decided to, say, increase by $100 million your budget, could you spend it wisely? I can assure you that any money that this <laughs> committee thinks good uh, sees fit, I promise it'll be good to yeah, be used. I, I, I believe you. Um, so... There's a record number in certain jurisdictions, and really a trend all over the country, of retirements by police officers and recruiting problems. Are you familiar with this? Very much so. What do you think is causing this? I think this is a very, very challenging time for the law enforcement. Have you ever known a more challenging time since you've been in the business? I have not. Okay. What can we do to deal with it? I think it starts with a recognition that it takes an incredibly special person to get up in the morning and put his or her life on the line for a total stranger. Right. And then when you stop and think about how few people are willing to do that, think about how many people are willing to do that every single day for an entire career. And so I think it starts with a level of gratitude and respect for those people. Is this a fair statement that police reform, I think, is necessary? Better training, better standards, uh, more exposure to departments for the conduct of the officers legally, but at the same time, a deeper appreciation for the job that police officers do. Do you agree that those two things are not inconsistent? I would. I would agree with okay, that. Okay, and I hope we can deliver there. Uh, in terms of the crime wave that we're facing, increase in murders particularly, the administration is going to announce a five-point program today to deal with the rise in crime. Were you consulted by the administration in that program? Uh, well, we yes, we're working with the Justice Department uh, through our piece of it. Um, I'm not, I haven't seen the announcement itself, but the... We're Do you know what the five-point plan is? Uh, I don't, I know our part. Uh, I don't okay, know which your part? part. So we are working with the department on something called Project Safe Neighborhoods, um, which is a, a revival of an effort that you may remember from um, the Bush administration, frankly. Um, and it's a, a multi-point plan to geared towards uh, attacking gun violence all, all across the country. And so the FBI is working with all of our partners on that. Do you believe that one of the reasons crime is on the rise is that <clears throat> certain jurisdictions have basically uh, eliminated bail. You catch them on Monday at morning and they're out on the streets Monday afternoon. Well, I do think there are a lot of causes, but I think one of the causes uh, of the violent crime spike uh, are certain kinds of um, prosecution practices and decrease. Yeah, we're not prosecuting enough people and we're sending a signal that maybe you can rob or loot a store and get away with it, and it sort of escalates. Is that fair to say? Well, I guess I would put it this way. I think there's nothing more disheartening to a law enforcement officer uh, to see somebody that you worked hard to arrest promptly back out committing a crime again. Yeah, uh, I, there's I, enough people to go after the first yeah, time without I, the same I, person I, over I, and over again. I totally agree. That's the problem. I hope we'll deal with it. Uh, when it comes to Russia... Dark side is supposedly responsible for the colonial pipeline attack and reveal, revile, R-E-V-I-L, uh, the attack on JP, JBS meat processing attack. Both these are Russian-speaking criminal organizations. 
Uh, do you believe it's possible that they could operate in Russia without Putin's government knowing about it? I have so many things I'd like to say. Um, <laughs> I, I, let me this put is it this, the chance to say. Yes, right. Well, uh, let me say this. Uh, you mentioned Dark Side. The other organization you're talking about is, is, uh, goes by the name R Evil. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, aptly named. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I think what I would say is this. The, uh, over and over again. We're policymakers. I know my time is up. We've got to make a decision eventually how to respond to Russia. We've had two cyber terrorism attacks emanating from Russian-speaking criminal enterprises. I think all of us believe it's impossible for these people to operate in Russia without some acknowledgement by the, some support by the government, or at least a lack of action on their part. We gotta make a decision. Would we be irresponsible in assuming that Putin is giving cover to these groups and the only way things will change is for him to pay a price for giving that cover? Or is that illogical on our part? I think the Russian government uh, has a lot of room for improvement on this subject. Let me just leave it at that. Thank you, Senator Ram. Very diplomatic, Director Ray. Senator Reid. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Chairman, and thank you, Director, for your service and the service and sacrifice of so many of your men and women in the FBI. Uh, January 6th was a disheartening moment, and I'm wildly understating that. Uh, there was an ad hoc response which relied a great deal on the National Guard uh, and then other police elements. Uh, we are looking forward now, as we should, to a more coherent uh, re- response to the situation occurs again. And as an alternative to the National Guard, I, I think, and I like your comments, uh, if we could put together a federal, state, local uh, law enforcement group that is trained, is integrated, is compensated, and is coordinated uh, for such an event with the participation of the Bureau in key areas, would that be more effective than summoning guard from everywhere? Uh, well, I certainly, let me say it this way, I, I certainly understand the attraction of having a law enforcement uh, kind of ready to deploy type of force. Um, uh, we've worked very well with the National Guard, but there are challenges that they face, uh, you know, in their ability to deploy. Now, on the FBI side, just to be clear, uh, you know, we don't and really never have in our 113 year history really done crowd control or static defense or things like that. So we don't really have the, the skills, the training, the, the equipment to do that part of it. What we do have are uh, overseen by our critical incident response group. We have things like our hostage rescue team which can deploy in certain situations. We have crisis negotiators. We have aerial surveillance in certain instances, you know, things like that. Uh, that we can lend to the effort, but but I think most of what you're talking about would would ultimately be more uh, on the the shoulders of, of other agencies. So I want to be careful not to speak for them. No, but I, I think you have critical uh, elements that you could engage, and they would have to rehearse practice, et cetera. So I don't. I think one of the lessons is uh, ad hoc is not that good when you're facing a mob of folks. Uh, the, the other aspect here, too, is uh, just for the record, the National Guard still waiting to get paid uh, um, hundreds of millions of dollars, which could affect their training this summer. So for all my colleagues, if you could urge everyone to pay the National Guard, that would be useful. Uh, one of the most difficult issues that you face in your intelligence capacity is trying to uh, recognize and respect First Amendment rights to communicate freely with uh, your uh, responsibility to monitor what's going on on the web. Can you give us an idea of, of how you make that call? Uh, I presume you have active, well, let me not presume, do you have active sort of uh, intelligence agents that are going through the web and trying to identify? So, um 
it's, this is a complicated topic. Uh, I'll try to do my best to give sort of a, a shorthand version, but uh, there may be nuances that get lost in my yes, description. Sir. So uh, what we, we ha there are longstanding policies that go back you know, 10, 15 plus years. The Attorney General guidelines as implemented by something called the DIOG uh, which are all designed to tell us what we can and cannot do, uh, especially when it uh, implicates civil liberties and so forth, and that there's parts of it that deal with social media. And so what we can do depends on whether or not we've got, what level of predication we have and whether we've got a, an authorized purpose. Um, we do get all kinds of tips and leads from the public, from partners right. of all shapes and sizes, uh, some of which include things on social media. Right. Uh, and we pursue those in whatever way we can under those policies. Right. What we don't do, and some people I think uh, are confused about this, what we don't do is just have people sitting there, at least without proper predication and an authorized purpose, just kind of monitoring right somebody's you know, uh, internet traffic and trying to see if there's something there just in case. That we, we don't currently do. Uh, now, in theory, somebody could look at the policies and decide that the balance needs to be struck a little differently. There's all kinds of considerations that go into that, but to give a really fulsome answer to your question would, would probably require a much longer discussion. I, I think it probably require a law review article, <laughs> at least. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Reed. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Ray, I want to thank you for your long service to our nation. Very much appreciated. The um, first topic I'd like to cover with you uh, has to do with the morale of the FBI. I had uh, the great honor of serving and working with a great FBI team in my previous position as ambassador to Japan. Uh, your rank and file are patriotic and honorable men and women who um, I, I'm certain wake up every day looking at how they can best serve the United States of America. But over the past five years, I think the reputation of the FBI has really come under challenge. Um, we've seen uh, a, a presidential candidate spied upon in 2016. We've seen uh, headquarter investigators using blatant political bias as they pursue investigations. And I think that really has called into question uh, America's confidence in, in the agency. Um, I know it's disheartening to the men and women that serve at the FBI who came to serve their nation, uh, not to pick sides in a presidential battle. Uh, I'm interested, and I know you're, you're working hard on this, but, but what are you doing, what are you undertaking to restore America's confidence and the confidence of the men and women that work for you in the agency as a nonpartisan and um, an, an unbiased uh, nonpolitical institution? So um, I have a lot to say on this subject. <laughs> Uh, first, uh, I'll stack our workforce up against any workforce anywhere, anytime. Uh, a lot of the press coverage uh, and discussion has been based on essentially two investigations over about an 18-month period involving a small number of people. And we're an organization of 37,000 people. It's been around for 113 years doing thousands and thousands of investigations every year. And what I see, what I hear uh, from the American people themselves is a resounding, even consistent uh, appreciation and respect for, for what our folks do. The, the hundreds of, we speak through our work, the hundreds of kids we've saved, the terrorist attacks we've disrupted, the scores of violent gangs, COVID fraudsters, Chinese spies, et cetera. Uh, and I say that from having visited all 56 of our field offices, most of them more than once, met with law enforcement partners from all 50 states and over 50 countries spoken with judges, prosecutors, private sector leaders, community leaders, victims and their families. Uh, and the refrain I get is very different from what's in a lot of the news coverage. Now, I'll give you a bright spot because I know you care about our workforce. Uh, our attrition rate is 0.4%. And you'd be hard pressed to find an organization out there, public or private, with an attrition rate that low. Second, our recruiting that is, the number of Americans all across this country, including every state represented on this subcommittee, applying to be special agents, so expressing their view of the FBI through their feet by trying to sign up and put their lives on the line, working with us for an entire career, has tripled, 
tripled what it was when I started this job. That's very encouraging. Um, and that's through the pandemic. And to me, that speaks volumes about what Americans everywhere actually think about the FBI. Uh, and I think you, you know that this committee stands behind you as well. And we want to see this budget deployed in a way that continues to support the morale and the, 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 the patriotic men and women that work for you. And I think that speaks volumes, the statistics that you went through. And like you, I have a lot to, to say and feel about this as well, because I think it's a great agency that you run. And I want to see the, the pristine image of the agency restored once again and appreciate your leadership in that direction. Thank you. Um, if I could turn right now to uh, an, another area. Um, this is having to do with a significant increase in crime that we saw in 2020. Uh, and again, a, another surge in crime that's underway right now. Homicide rates up 30% last year, another 25% this year. Um, back in 2020, Operation Legend was put into play. Uh, sadly, Operation Legend was named for a four-year-old boy who was killed by a stray bullet in Kansas City. Um, that operation led to the arrest of some 6,000 criminals, um, a confiscation of 17 kilos of fentanyl that are killing our kids every day. Um, in, in light of the surge that's underway yet again in crime, why is it that Operation Legend was brought to an end in December of 2020? Uh, I can't, you know, Operation Legend was something that was uh, run by the Justice Department, so I probably would leave that part to, to the Justice Department. Uh, certainly, I agree with you that I think it was a big success. It probably was not a sustainable effort, you know, in perpetuity, uh, given the way in which we were all um, essentially just all surging hands. resources yep. from all over. Um, we are, I mentioned, I think, in response to Senator Moran's question, that on our end, we've recently created this violent crime rapid deployment team, which is an effort to take a little bit of the, the idea behind legend and, and make that available. But that's really, that's not going to be a complete answer in its own right. And I think you're exactly right that this is a topic um, that cannot be uh, overlooked in the middle of everything else that's going on. Because I think most Americans right now, the security threat they're most concerned about is violent crime. Well, thank you for leadership in that direction, um, Director Ray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Leahy and Chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Thank you very much, Director. It's always good to see you, and thank you for being here. Uh, I, I think we can all talk about how much we appreciate what the men and women of the FBI do and truly mean it. Uh, I've known <clears throat> several of your predecessors, worked with them, and, and worked with the FBI both in Vermont and down here, and, and, and I do appreciate their skill and their dedication. And it made me think that there, with all these wild conspiracy th uh, theories going on about the insurrection on January 6th, all of which have tried to portray the attack on the Capitol as anything but a violent assault by domestic extremists on the heart of the democracy, even though everybody who was here saw that's exactly what it was. You helped debunk some of these theories when we last spoke in March when you uh, testified in the Judiciary Committee. It seems a new crop of excuses and conspiracy theories sprouted up since you testified before the House Oversight Committee. I think that was last week. So let me uh, give you another opportunity to discredit any of the dangerously bogus claims that have been floating around about the January 6th attack, particularly those that are relating to the FBI's involvement in the attack. And considering these things, claiming that they were, let me just ask you directly, <clears throat> did anyone in the Trump White House ever encourage or direct you or anyone in your staff to downplay the potential threat of violence on January 6th when Congress was scheduled to take our constitutionally mandated presidential vote count? No. That's, uh, I'll take that elaborate answer as, as a no, and I appreciate it. Now, you're uh, <clears throat> responsible for investigating 
federal election crimes such as, and, and, I, and I'm glad you had a chance to say that because you've probably seen some of this baloney that's come out yeah. since the last testimony. And the FBI is responsible for investigating federal election crimes such as voter suppression that intentionally target minority protected classes the growing wave of voter suppression laws in dozens of states raise serious concerns. There could be an accompanying spike in federal election crimes committed in furtherance of suppression efforts. What are you doing at the FBI to prepare for the upcoming elections in which many of us expect to see unprecedented level of voter suppression? So uh, we're doing a, a few different things. Um, we have election crime coordinators in every field office, uh, and of course they focus on the full manner of types of election crimes. Uh, and they're, they're all well connected with each other and through our criminal investigative division. Uh, voter suppression specifically, when we get involved, is more through our civil rights program. Uh, and so we work closely with the Justice Department, both the Civil Rights Division and the U.S. Attorney's offices on that. Uh, in addition, uh, you may remember from our past engagements that uh, we created, I created the uh, Foreign Influence Task Force uh, early on in my tenure. And although that's focused on foreign influence, of course we are concerned about foreign influence uh, influence, malign foreign influence that could in turn have a, uh, a sort of surreptitious effect on, uh, on voter suppression. So we're coming at that piece of it as well. And as you know, I supported you when you, uh, when you formed that. Do you need further resources? Now here's your chance. It's not OMB asking you, I'm asking you as chairman of the committee, do you need further resources in this area? Uh, we're busier than we ever have been, uh, and I can assure you uh, that if uh, if the Congress uh, sees fit to send us more resources on this, I can am quite confident that it will be put to good use. I thought that was probably so. And my last question is on uh, NICS, the National Incident Criminal Background Check. Uh, we've seen, let's see, last year you processed nearly 40 million firearm background checks. I think it's about... 20 million so far this year. Uh, Congress provided you 179 million in emergency funding to help increase, uh, help address the increased workload of gun background checks. How has that been uh, utilized, and is it enough? Uh, so we've been able to put it to use, uh, and we're very grateful for it because of the the uptick in the operational tempo out there to hire more personnel and to make system improvements. Um, that funding was, as I recall, essentially a two-year funding, uh, which explains why we didn't have more of that in, in this budget request. But make no mistake, the, the pace that we're on, uh, we will be needing more of that uh, in the future for sure because right now we're having to pull personnel from other critical functions to help out and do things like pay mandatory overtime just to be able to, to kind of triage the situation. So long term, we're absolutely going to need more resources, both for personnel out there uh, and for systems improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Capito. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ray, and thank you to all of your uh, those in, in the FBI, we thank them uh, from the bottom of our hearts of everything that they do every day. And uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Leahy for teeing me up for this, because when you said out there, out there is in Clarksburg, West Virginia, uh, where they run the background checks at, uh, uh, at, on the uh, NICS system. And one of the statistics, uh, Senator Leahy said almost $20 million already this year, but we had the highest May ever of 3,222,105 background checks, which is an amazing. Uh, so I'm happy to hear, and I, I want to be as supportive as we possibly can be through this committee uh, to uh, help you with the resources that you need. So I'm going to ask a different question rather than um, tout what a great job they do out in, in Clarksburg, because we, we, we both know that. Um, and we've heard about the rise in crime over the last two years, particularly this summer, seems to be particularly troublesome. 
What do you do you correlate any of that with the rising number of firearm purchases? What how do you all analyze that at the FBI, the rising number of background checks that are being performed in terms of purchases? Well, I, I don't know that we've been able to uh, I mean, people c- settle on one specific defense. factor, but yeah. certainly uh, there have been a number of factors that drive, I think, the, the, the spike in violent crime. So COVID had a huge impact. Uh, you're talking about everything from trial backlogs, early releases, uh, you know, unemployment, et cetera. Uh, we have more juveniles committing violent crime. Uh, and there's all kinds of challenges in our legal systems for, for dealing with them. Uh, I mentioned in response to, I think, Senator Graham's question, certain prosecution practices and decreased mm-hmm. sentences. Right. I think that has an effect. The prevalence of firearms uh, in the wrong hands uh, is certainly uh, an issue as well, especially gun trafficking uh, across state lines and things like These are all things that I think collectively contribute uh, to the problem. Yeah, I mean, I think the rise also is uh, obviously if you're going to legally purchase and go through a background check, it's it it's probably is in response to a rising uh, criminal element for a defense. I mean, more people are feeling defenseless, more people at home more or and feel like uh, they're maybe making those purchases to protect them and their family. So I thank you for making sure those are getting safely into those hands. Um, I want to talk about cyber attacks. I asked the same question to Secretary Blinken and Attorney General Garland about ransomware. It's particularly interesting to me because it's semi new phenomenon and none of it's every article you read, it's not really sure know how to handle it and, and what to do. And that it is a global issue as well. Uh, and so I'm interested to know if you're working with your global partners uh, on how to address ransomware. And then you read from time to time what the different advice is. Pay the ransom, don't pay the ransom. Are, are you, how are you all addressing that? I mean, is that something that you, I don't know that you give advice, but you would, you know, for a large breach like the Colonial Pipeline, certainly you have to be involved with that. And how you're seeing ransomware, we know it's going to get worse. Uh, and so I suppose that's the, why the cyber part of your budget is going to be increased, and that would be the area that you would look at the ransomware issue. Am I correct in assuming that? Certainly uh, the, the part of the uh, cyber uh, enhancement request uh, ransomware is a huge component of that. It's going to go to all the different kinds of cyber intrusions. Right. Where some nations, you know, something like solar winds would also be the kind of thing that would be addressed through that enhancement. Uh, but ransomware, I think, has become particularly challenging because we've seen the total volume uh, of money uh, paid, I think, triple. You know, over the last year or so, uh, you're talking about higher and higher ransoms, uh, more sophisticated attacks. Uh, we're just talking about uh, ransomware as a service, which the Colonial Pipeline uh, case illustrated, where sophisticated developers of ransomware so. then basically outsource it to mm-hmm. less sophisticated actors, which just expands the, the problem and the availability of the technique. Uh, and they're also now more and more engaging in a, sort of a mix of both the, uh, the locking up of the system and the exfiltration and leaking or extortion that way as well. Uh, As far as guidance uh, to victims, our guidance is don't pay the ransom. But let me say this, I understand that it's a hard decision for a company or a municipal government or whatever it happens to be to make. And the one thing that I think is most important by far is that whether they pay or don't pay, they get in touch with us right away early on because when they do, There's all kinds of things that we can do. Uh, In the Colonial Pipeline case, for example, we were, as has been reported, able to essentially seize and confiscate some of the ransom, uh, a lot of the ransom, and to hit the bad guys right where it hurts. In other cases, uh, it's not all the time, but it does happen. Sometimes through other work we've done, we might have the decryption key Mm -hmm. and be able to help the company unlock their data without having to pay the ransom best of both worlds. So there's a lot of things we can do. What we can't do is much if we're not uh, coordinated with early. Um, but our strategy has to be whole of government, working with the private sector, working with foreign partners, as you mentioned, because invariably these actors are overseas, uh, going after the actors, going after their helpers, going after their infrastructure, going after their money. Um, so it's a comprehensive uh, type of approach. 
Well, we want to be, again, as supportive as we can be because this is a growing problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Capito. Um, before I call on Senator Braun, we just had a vote called. My intent, unless someone else shows up for the committee, is to go ahead and ask Senator Braun and Senator Kennedy for their questioning and then to end the hearing. So just so everybody understands where we're going. Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. In court submissions, uh, mm -hmm. the FBI's noted that it I hear you. had... In trouble, then. I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry. That's okay. FBI had prior knowledge uh, that there were going to be, might be trouble on that day, um, and some of it was pretty stark. Now, my question is, was there any plan that you were going to implement based upon that information uh, being out there prior to what occurred on the 6th? Was there a plan in place that you had ready to go should things unfurl the wrong way? Uh, well, we had a couple things. We had pre-positioned um, tactical response, you know, SWAT teams from the National Capital Region to be available if called upon by our partners who are responsible for the security of, of the Capitol complex uh, or, or attacks elsewhere in the National Capital Region because we didn't have, uh, as I've said before, intelligence to my knowledge that indicated uh, that, that there were going to be hundreds and hundreds of people trying to storm and siege the Capitol. Um, so we had pre-positioned tactical resources. We had command posts that we stood up both in the Washington field office and at headquarters in our SIOC that we were running the day before to, and the pur purpose of those, the reason those are important is because you got all these other agencies and partners with people there too, and the idea is to make sure that everybody's getting the same information, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, and that, that's the goal of that. So those are some of the things that we were doing uh, beforehand. Uh, and we, of course, had put out different kinds of intelligence products, uh, essentially bulletins and things like that, uh, over the course of the year leading up to January 6th. Um, so those are a few of the things that we were doing. And did, did you share all that information uh, with the Capitol Police along the way and especially leading up to when you started to get, see more traffic online? Well, I'm not aware of any pertinent information we didn't share, but I, I know that we, uh, these intelligence products I was listing off, of course, those would have gone not just to the Capitol Police, but to MPD and, and all the other partners as well. Um, the, to the extent that we had sort of late-breaking raw information, there's been a lot of discussion about this information from our Norfolk field office. That was something that we passed on to our partners, including in particular the Capitol Police, in three different ways. Now, that was raw, unverified information, but in the abundance of caution, we thought we'd better get it to people as quickly as possible. And then this command post part of it is so important because that's where... Uh, having been in these command posts, you know, every 30 minutes there's a briefing where every agency is quickly going through, here's what we're hearing, here's what we're seeing, and they're all there and it's all being shared, and that's, that's the point of it, to be able to do it in a nimble, agile, uh, transparent way. And in retrospect, would you have done anything differently? <sighs> well, certainly uh, we've now arrested, you know, close to 500 a little over 500 if you include our partners, people. And so if we had known that those people were going to do what they did, there's all kinds of things we would have done differently. Uh, we are more broadly trying to look at can we develop better sources to anticipate things like this? Can we develop better data analytics to deal with the deluge, the terabytes and terabytes of information to separate uh, the wheat from the chaff, as it were? Uh, we're looking at the encryption issue because a lot of the communications between the, the domestic terrorists are happening through encrypted platforms that we don't have a ready-made lawful access solution to. Uh, and, of course, we're going to be looking at how we review and evaluate uh, open source information, uh, you know, social media, that kind of thing. So does that mean you think it was maybe more spontaneous than planned? Or would you have, if it had been that obvious in terms of the planning of it, probably would have done more. Well, I think it's, it's a little complicated to answer. The reason I say that is because you, you, in terms of the people committing crimes on January 6th, you kind of have two buckets of people. You have one group of people who um, 
clearly committed crimes, including violence and destruction, in a more spontaneous way. Uh, but you also had some other people that we now know, we now know from investigative work we're doing after January 6th, that were particularly bad actors who had infiltrated and were, and, and were more organized among themselves. That's a smaller group, but they, you know, they are the most dangerous ones. One final question. Uh, Capitol surrounded by a, a non-scalable fence. Uh, to me, in being here, obviously, ever since day since then, uh, hadn't seen any credible threats. You may know of more. Do you think that fence needs to remain up, or can we take it down? Because to me, uh, I think it, there needs to be a good argument that something is impending or likely, or e either it needs to come down, not only for the look, but for the cost of it to boot. What's your recommendation? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I could really weigh in on that. I mean, we, we as I, I mentioned in response to one of the earlier questions, we really don't have expertise in static defense and, uh, and physical security in that sense. So uh, that's a question really better directed to the, the people who have that. And have you gotten any cues for any other impending incidents that might require you to keep it up? I mean, does the intel show that there's an imminent threat of anything, or does it show the opposite? Well, again, without reference to the, any fencing issue, uh, I don't think, at least to my knowledge, we're not tracking any specific or credible threats to, to the Capitol. Uh, Sounds like a good reason to take the fence down. Thank you. Senator Coons. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Shaheen, Ranking Member Moran, uh, FBI Director Rage. Great to be with you again. Um, and I just want to um, thank you and the 37,000 men and women of the FBI um, who do uh, the hard and difficult and demanding work of uh, keeping us safe each and every day. I'm uh, mindful always of the sacrifices of law enforcement at the federal, state, and local level and uh, join you in um, uh, grieving the loss, uh, the line of duty death of Special Agents Alfin and Schwarzenberger earlier this year. And um, I'm always conscious of the ways in which um, the safety uh, of the men and women in law enforcement is one of the paramount concerns you carry uh, day in and day out. Um, we also have, you know, an obligation to make sure that law enforcement is conducting itself in a way that's uh, transparent and respectful and appropriate. And um, I am enthusiastic about the president's commitment to have federal law enforcement now deployed with body-worn cameras and um, look forward to hearing from you as that is implemented going forward. Um, back in March, uh, when I think I last saw you, um, I asked for uh, an assurance that the FBI as an organization would be as responsive as possible um, to requests from members of the Judiciary Committee regarding outstanding requests for information. Um, Senator Whitehouse uh, just um, spoke to this earlier uh, this week, uh, and he and I have requests that are now um, two years old and have gone without any response um, will you commit to working with us to get appropriate and responsive answers uh, for these outstanding questions uh, now from the last Congress? Uh, I'm not tracking the specific piece of correspondence, uh, but certainly I will have my staff follow up with yours and see how we can be more timely and, and helpful. Please, because it's something that, um, you know, I think has significantly agitated Senator Whitehouse and a number of other members of the of the Judiciary Committee about responsiveness and transparency, and uh, I... I Love to work with you to get this resolved. Uh, we've seen a spike in violent crime in a lot of places uh, around the country. My hometown of Wilmington is one of them. The president's speaking to this uh, today, and I think we need to ensure that federal, state, and local law enforcement uh, work collaboratively um, to address this uptick. Um, the FBI can be particularly helpful uh, by providing uh, training and resources. Uh, the county police department, I was associated with for a decade. Um, nothing was more desired than a, a period at the FBI Academy, uh, both as a professionalization tool and to build out a network of uh, professional colleagues. How does the FBI plan to continue to strengthen partnerships uh, with state and local law enforcement um, in cities like Wilmington and in counties like Newcastle, Delaware? So I, I completely agree that partnerships are uh, critical, uh, really across everything we do, but especially on violent crime. And in fact, one of my four pillars uh, for the organization has been partnerships. Uh, and I, my message to our folks has been, we want every partner to be able to say there's no better partner than the FBI. Um, now, uh, you mentioned a couple ways in which we do that. Uh, the National Academy at Quantico, where we train 
sort of uh, the stars of the future and sort of middle, upper middle management in state and local police departments. That was uh, uh, something we're very proud of. It's been around for decades. Uh, it was stalled somewhat during the pandemic for obvious reasons, but I'm very excited that it's starting back up again uh, soon. Uh, and we expect to be all in on that. Now, uh, locally, we try to do it through task forces where we try to have our two, the FBI's two, plus our partners two, equal more than four, make it five, six, seven. And there have been some great examples of that, uh, including in Wilmington. I know there was a gang, I think it was like the, uh, the G-Shine game or something, gang or something like that, where, um, where I think there were close to 40 arrests. But what was interesting, the reason I bring that one up is that during the pandemic, federal grand juries were uh, largely on hold in a lot of places, including in Delaware. Uh, but our folks were able to basically take our investigative work, working with our state local partners. And so most of the arrests ended up being local arrests, but with an FBI investigation to support them. So it's a great example of the point you're making. Well, I look forward to that, con that continued partnership and to strengthening and deepening it. Um, on the body-worn cameras, um, the, the directive that they be um, deployed, ATF, FBI, DEA, marshals, um, I support. Does your budget fully support that deployment and implementation, or um, do you need additional funding to, to fully implement it? It's a good question. We, we will need. Um, right now, uh, the, the budget request that we have is geared not towards the FBI agents, and body-worn cameras, but towards our task force officers. And again, not the cameras themselves, but through all the pretty significant expense associated with the, the storage, storage. Of, of the footage. On the FBI side, we're, uh, as you referenced, there, there's a, a, a phased-in plan that includes a pilot uh, in a couple field offices for us, and then it'll go from there. And we will certainly need you know, potentially quite significant resources to be able to cover the costs for all of our personnel of not just the storage, uh, but the cam in, the, in, for in their case, the cameras themselves. Well, I look forward to getting an updated um, request from you in that regard. Um, when it comes to NICS background checks, um, last year there was a 40% increase in NICS background check requests compared to the previous year. That pace may simply increase again this year. Um, and given the current rules, um, if the NICS system doesn't return a result within three days, buyers are permitted to proceed. Um, has the NICS section been able to keep pace with this steadily increasing workload, uh, or are there more guns now being sold after a background check wasn't completed within that three-day window, and are you planning to request increased resources for NICS? So uh, the, the good news is that our workforce uh, at NICS is extraordinary and very hardworking, and even with the 40 million record-breaking number of checks we had last year, they were still able to process 95 to 96% of the requests within the three days. Um, uh, but as you mentioned, the pace is increasing even this year. Uh, the, as far as whether we have enough resources for it, um, the, the supplemental that we got covered us for essentially two years in terms of increases, which is why we didn't, you didn't see more of it in the 22 budget request. But, but we absolutely will need more resources for NICS following that because otherwise it's just a, a short-term uh, fix. My last question, Mr. Temporary. Well, this Frank is a question for Senator Kennedy, who uh, was cut, uh, was, was held to the exact time in the, uh, in in another the other committee. Uh, may I continue to recognize Senator Coons and then recognize you, Senator Kennedy? Last Senator, question with the forbearance of Senator Kennedy, deeply appreciated. Um, I, I think all of us are concerned about steadily increasing uh, efforts by China um, in espionage, in um, trade secret theft, um, and some of the ways in which we've seen both state and non-state actors recently engage in um, a variety of uh, expensive, complex, and difficult attacks. Does the FBI need additional resources to protect the private entities uh, who lack the resources to resist sophisticated state-sponsored cyber attacks? Well, um, we, we are essentially asking for more resources, that, a lot of it which would be going to that mission, both through the counterintelligence enhancement that we requested and through our cyber enhancement. Um, but there's no question that there is no counterintelligence threat 
greater than the threat posed by China. And we're opening a new, as I mentioned in my opening, new investigation every 12 hours, uh, 10 to 12 hours. Uh, and it's about a 1,300% economic espionage investigation increase over the last decade. And so uh, this, this is a, a challenge that uh, dwarfs, in many ways, the resources we have. So anything that the uh, Congress can send our way to help with this uh, will be put very much to good use. Well, thank you very much, uh, Director Ray, and thank you for your forbearance, um, Senator Moran and Senator Kennedy. Senator Kennedy is recognized. Um, I'm going to follow up, Mr. Director, on a point made by Senator Leahy. Um, he, he talked about the massive voter suppression that he's expecting in 2022. Do you, your intelligence reports show they're going to be, there's going to be massive voter suppression in 2022? I, I, I don't believe I uh, characterized um, the, the voter suppression threat as massive, and I'm, I'm not aware of any intelligence assessment we've done that, that uh, quantifies it. Certainly voter suppression is a concern. It's something we investigate, something right. we uh, pursue. Okay. Um, on the next database, where do you get what do you get the information for? For the NICS database, so uh, a lot of sources, but um, most of the information is uh, coming from state and local law enforcement. Are they all sending in all the information they're supposed to? Uh, we are continuing to improve that. Uh, the Fixed NICS Act that uh, that uh, Congress uh, put in place has been a big help in that regard. Uh, and every year we're increasing the the completeness uh, of the NICS database. But there's still room for improvement. Yeah, there's still a lot of holes in it, aren't there? There are, yes. Yeah. And the truth is, I mean, for some, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but my understanding is that for some... Um, at the state and local level, it's just not a priority. They, it's not that they're sitting around watching Netflix. They, they've just got, they're busy doing other stuff. Would that be a fair statement? Well, I, uh, I understand why you would describe it that way. I've got to be a little bit careful to characterize um, our partners uh, as you know, distracted. But I, I, I will say that, um, you know, I've gone out to Nick's and, put on the headset and sat there with the operator, listen to the calls and see how it works. And, um, you know, some of these things, especially when you start getting into, you know, misdemeanor domestic violence offenses and yeah. things like that, it can get kind of complicated. And if the records out in whatever jurisdiction it is aren't ready at hand or clear, uh, uh, it can become uh, a, ch a real challenge. And that was magnified during the pandemic, right. you know, because a lot of departments – local departments, you know, were not at work. Uh, and so that... Had well, I, I, I just, I hear, I read about the president and others saying, well, the problem is we need to expand background checks. And it just seems to me that uh, a big part of our problem, nothing's perfect, of course, but a big part of our problem is that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the current system we has, have is only as good as the information inputted. And all the information isn't being inputted. It's just not. Um, and I think fixed next did help. And I think it's better, but I don't think it's well. And it would seem to me that that would be a logical place to start. Is my, is my thinking faulty? I don't think your thinking is faulty. I think uh, we we all share the goal of keeping guns out of the hands of those legally prohibited from having them, which should be the the table stakes in this uh, endeavor, and that's what the NICS system is designed to do. Uh, to the extent that the holes that you identified are holes in different agencies and departments, you know, patchwork around the country, uh, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, point out that some of them may need, you know, grant funding or resources I, I get to, to I help them because it may be a resource issue for As them. I say, I'm not yeah. suggesting they're just sitting around watching Netflix. They're working. They've 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 been uh, uh, cussed and discussed and uh, accused of everything in the world, and their budget's been cut, and 
then we wonder why crime goes up. But uh, so I'm not criticizing them. I'm just pointing out that it seems to me that the, the system is only good as the data that's in, uh, put into it. Uh, let me ask you a final question. Uh, I just want your opinion on this. What, why do you think Chicago has become the largest outdoor shooting range in the world? Uh, well, I mean, I think I've referenced a lot of the factors from a national perspective. I don't know that I can, sitting here right now, give you a Chicago-specific explanation, but uh, certainly some of the same trends that I described nationally would undoubtedly be at play in Chicago. Um, I know that, uh, you know, over the past uh, year, we've had, you know, 200, this is just the FBI now, you know, 270 gang arrests in Chicago, 150 maybe violent crime arrests, uh, and that's just in the past year or so. And I know that our partners there, we have some great partners in Chicago, you know, police department, uh, among other agencies, uh, and they're all stretched pretty thin. Thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you. Senator Kennedy, thank you. Uh, if there's no further questions uh, to be asked this afternoon, the senators have until June the 29th to submit additional questions for the subcommittee's official hearing record. We request that the FBI respond within 30 days. The subcommittee stands in recess.